almost always had some kind of complication where it doesn't work the way that it's supposed to. Please open your Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And uh, we are in our really part two of a series that we began beginning at, uh, at the outset of this year. And uh, of course our series was Soul Winning Saturation, but the part of the series that we're in now is, of course we want to teach all believers how to be not just soul winners, but effective soul winners. People that, uh, the, the people that you know and encounter, you're able to share the gospel with them and, and they get saved. And let me just share something by way of encouragement with you as well. You know, uh, a number of our teenagers are pretty good natural soul winners. Several of uh, our young people sometimes, uh, sometimes like Jermancy and uh, Johnny Ted, a couple of guys, I'll get a call at Chakizi. I'll get a call during the week and they'll say, Pastor Price, we're talking to this guy, and he, you know, he says or he thinks or whatever. Well, they're they're what are they doing? Well, they're they're having a discussion about eternal life with their friends, and then they talk about Bible teaching, Bible truths, and those things. And they're calling and just you know, they accept the authority of the Word of God. Their friends do, but they're talking about Bible truth in a natural way, in a natural discussion. You know, everyone has Bible questions. I remember being young, being afraid, oftentimes. I, you know, we talked to beginning initially about the reasons why sometimes we're afraid to preach the gospel. I think sometimes we're afraid uh, because we feel like we're not qualified. And so at the beginning of our series, we learned that what qualifies you to be a soul winner is your salvation. Being saved qualifies you to be a soul winner. Sometimes you think, well, you know what, this person is more intellectual than I am. And, you know, that's, that's just a myth. Uh, intellect has nothing to do with whether or not it's true, and it is true. And so what qualifies you is that you're saved. If you're saved, you're called to be a soul winner. And if you're called to be a soul winner, then the qualifier isn't how smart you are, how intelligent you are. Uh, and so when we initially had our five-week series, one of the things that we emphasized is that you don't need to be so concerned with what the person knows. You don't need to be so concerned with being able to have an answer for any question that could be ever asked in order to be a soul winner. Sometimes we want to be just uber qualified to where we know there's just no way I could fail at soul winning. And then we'll, uh, then we'll preach the gospel. And oftentimes what that is, I don't think that it's a conscious decision on our parts uh, to not preach the gospel, but that's what it results in. And I don't think that, that God's the one that's, that is trying to convince us that we're not qualified to be soul winners. So we saw that a soul winner initially is a man, woman, boy, or girl <laughs> who's saved. And that's your qualifier. Uh, some people think they're not qualified because of their testimony. Well, you don't have a great testimony. Well, that's why you need to be saved, because you're wicked. You're a sinner. And uh, if you have a fellowship issue, it's a good reason to deal with the sin in your life and be able to have the victory that's yours in Christ Jesus. But victory isn't what qualifies you to preach the gospel. Being saved is what qualifies you to preach the gospel. You say, Pastor, a hypocrite can't preach the gospel. Unsaved people can preach the gospel, actually. Actually. I've had a number of times, I've had people who are not saved tell other unsaved people, you know what you need. Have you ever, have you ever seen that? You know, here's a mom or a dad who aren't saved and they got a, a son or a daughter who has a besetting sin in their life. Maybe, an alcohol, maybe they're an alcoholic, maybe they have a drug addiction. And they'll say, you know what you need? You need to get saved. You know that church over there, you need what those people have. Because I've seen people get saved and I've seen them get help that way. And they'll even try to explain the gospel to themselves not being saved. They'll try to explain the gospel to another unsaved person because they see uh, the results of victory. And, you know, they're not saved. They don't understand that you need it. Not just so that you can have victory in your life, but so that you can have eternal life. But a lost person can preach the gospel. Do you remember the, uh, the, the uh, woman with the unclean spirit in her following Paul uh, around? and saying these men are servants of the Most High God, these men are servants of the Most High God, a lost person can preach the truth. John Wesley said that about himself. What's that? John Wesley said that about himself. Oh, good. That, yeah, great illustration. Remember John Wesley, before he was even saved, was a missionary, mm -hmm. preaching the gospel uh, to the pagans. <laughs> and then on his way home, he realized he himself had never been born again. He wasn't saved. And so... Uh, if you think that your testimony or what you know or your qualifications is what makes you so winner, you're, you're mistaken. But this part of the series is a little different. This is really reaching your religious friends. And so this is one of those ones where we want to just look at the, the fact that 
we as believers need to understand where someone's coming from. Again, I'm not uh, uh, necessarily a Francis Schaeffer uh, fan, but I like what Francis Schaeffer said in the last century when he was asked, if you had one hour to share the gospel with someone, uh, what would you do? And he said, I would spend 55 minutes asking them questions and then having an understanding of what they know or what they think, then I would spend five minutes explaining for them how to be saved. That statement is very revealing for two reasons. First of all, the gospel is very simple. The gospel is not so complex that it cannot be explained simply and clearly and quickly. But terminology is everything, isn't it? And so as we were doing this, as we're looking at this Catholicism, this is a video that we did some years ago in a Sunday School series, Essentials of Salvation. One of the things that we're going to be doing as we watch this video is we're going to be looking at how religion twists or takes truth and redefines it. And even last week in our discussion in Sunday School, we talked about how Catholicism, how that... Uh, being born again is a term that the Catholics, you know, that really bothered them a lot, so they came up with their own definition for being born again. And uh, a lot of the truths that have to do with it being Christ alone, they'll affirm, and you're going to see this, but then there's a twist or a slant on it. If you're preaching the gospel to your Catholic friends, you'll find that it's very, very difficult today. It's very different than when I was a kid, even. It's very difficult today to find, to find differences between what Catholics believe and what we believe, and yet what we believe is so diametrically different. But it's because of terms, because of terminology. And if you're sharing the gospel with someone who's in religion, oftentimes they're going to think they, they believe the same thing, that you believe the same thing, but the way that terms are redefined makes all the difference. And so uh, I want to just start again in the beginning. Last week we interrupted it so much that we only made it five minutes. So I want to make it without interruption to the five-minute point. And uh, before we do that, if you're in Acts chapter 17, I want to read again this dialogue that, that Paul had in Athens. And now this is not Paul you know, trying to explain to the Athenians that we believe the same thing. But what he is doing is helping them understand, I know what you believe and you're wrong. Now, he's very diplomatic about it, but he's also very direct. I, you know, let's just read it very quickly. In verse 16, now while Paul waited for them in Athens, this is Acts 17, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preacheth unto them Jesus and... The resurrection, again, the resurrection is the distinction between the idolaters and the and the or and the Athenians and, and what Paul was preaching and the truth. Because they believed really in uh, some some uh, religions call it, you know, uh, what it was when you come back from the dead in a different form of life. Uh, they, incarnation. Incar incarnation and uh, different different ways. But they essentially believe that, you know, the idols could be in, in a, like a king or an emperor could be a reincarnated deity and so forth. Well, but as far as you yourself, as yourself, only having one life, one soul, one person coming back from the dead, that was a strange thing. And so in verse 19, they took him and brought him unto the Oropagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know therefore what, things you, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else, either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. And help beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. And then he goes on to give the gospel, God that made the world and all things therein seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Now, just a couple weeks ago, I was in Athens, and one of the things that's still there today are temples. Absolutely. I mean, here you have modern buildings, and then right in the middle of modern, uh, you know, of a modern city are these couple thousand year old marble temples. Just thousands of them. All over, they're just everywhere. If you dig anywhere, you find them. And of course, you know, on the Acropolis, all the temples that are on the top of that 
hill and where Paul is speaking at with the Acropolis in the background. I showed you guys a picture of that a couple of weeks ago. And that is the background for what Paul is saying. Again, he knows what they believe. If you want to share the gospel with people and you say, God, you better be thinking about what they think God is because they think Zeus is the greatest of gods. But Paul said, God that made all things dwelleth not in temples. And so right there is a shot to their religion. Here we're standing, we're literally in their in, in their in their eyesight, in their line of sight are probably ten temples. And Paul said, God isn't in any of these buildings you've erected that you're so proud of. Dwelt not in a temple made with hands, neither is worship with man's hands, as though he needeth any needed anything. And it's another shot at their gods. Because their gods had to be worshipped in order to exist. In other words, there was this relationship between people and gods. The gods need to be worshipped, and so they would do evil things to people and in order to get the people to worship them. It's like they fed on worship, and then the people could benefit by worshipping them. And so there was this pacifist, pacifying uh, type of worship. In other words, if it's a god of, <clears throat> excuse me, god of the sea, well, then you need to make offerings. You needed to... Uh, make a good temple for him dwelling. You wanted the, the God of the sea. Was it Archimedes? Or, uh, I can't remember even what the... Anyway, I, I, I always learn. I always forget all the names of the pagan gods. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, the, if it's the God of the sea, you're a lot better off with him living in a temple than out wreaking havoc in the sea. And so you worship him, and the more worship you give him, the more he's satisfied. So he needs worship, and you need... Uh, to, to not be destroyed in the sea. So there's this, God needs me, I need Him. But God in the heavens doesn't need anybody or anything. See, that's Paul's shot at their God. Your God's a weak God. He's a limited God. And so, uh, having having said that, let's let's spin off and let's... The point I want to make is that as we watch this video, we need to understand what people believe. And we need to understand where they're coming from. And it isn't that you have to be you know, a brilliant theologian. Truth is truth, and when you know a little bit of truth, it's very apparent what error is. And so I just want to go through this. And again, the introduction uh, to, to this video we, we mentioned last week, most of us were here for our introduction to it. But this is not, you know, me going and debating with a Catholic priest. This is me going and saying, these are what we believe to be essential to have eternal life. We believe that, that the Word of God is a final authority and that it is the source of truth. It's basically what, we, what our statement was. And we believe the person of Christ, that Jesus is God, that He was born of a virgin, and that He's the only way. There's not Jesus and anything. And so we were very, very clear. Sent the uh, messages <coughs> corresponded with this gentleman, this priest, before we came so he could tell us whether or not he believe what we believe. And here's the deal. A lot of times we think, well, because they're similar in faith, because Catholics say they believe in being born again, because Catholics believe in the deity, because Catholics believe, believe, believe these things, well, then they're probably saved. And so we're asking the question, is that so? Is it so? Is salvation what the Word of God teaches or is salvation in other means? So let's see how far we can get in our video today. We won't make it all the way through. I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit. We were at the uh, five, 545 point last week. And so I'm going to see if I can find that. Let's see, 342. Uh, that's about where we were the other day. So I'm going to just go back just a ways. Remember this where he's saying we, we, uh, we teach the whole Bible in our church? How much of the Bible do they teach? So after we get through three years, we find the Old Testament, the whole Bible, Testament. on our Sunday Masses. Then in our weekday Masses, we have year one and year two. And basically we do the same thing because you got five days in a week and Saturday six. And so you've got many more days in the weekday than you do on Sundays. So you only need two years to get through basically all of Scripture. Now there are certain parts of Scripture that might be skipped, not for moral or theological grounds, but they're not, you know, they're not that, uh, I'm not sure how to use that word, but they... <laughs> it's just not that, you know, important. <laughs> All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Well, scripture is not such a big deal. You know, I don't want to say he's <laughs> being careful about how he says it. There might be some scripture which is skipped, like 86% of the Old Testament and 25% of the New Testament. 
a lot. They may be a hard to use in a liturgy, I would say. I don't, I'm not quite sure how to word that. So at any rate, you're going through the whole of Scripture with your people, and we've been doing this for 2,000 years. So in one sense, they say, well, the Catholic people, they never read the Bible. Well, until now, in the last 50 years, there's a lot of truth to that. But in another sense of the word, Catholics for 2,000 years have been hearing the Bible using this pattern. For in what language? Latin. Latin. And how many people have spoken Latin in the last 2,000 years? None. Only the priests. Priest. Only the educated. Right? So we, you come to Mass and we teach the whole Bible, basically, minus 25%. Minus 85% of the Old Testament, 86% of the Old Testament. So, you know, it's basically the whole Bible. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you came to Mass, then you'd heard it all. Well, in the last 50 years, because, you know, we do it in English now. And, uh, but there's a little bit of dishonesty there, isn't there? And it's interesting because I'm not, you, you'll, you'll see as, as we watch this video, I'm not setting him up. I'm not trying to entrap him. I'm not trying to get him to say things. He knows the truth, and he's trying to subvert it. Very interesting. 2,000 years, they've been hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. I started out doing one of the stories in, in Scripture for the people, and they're all going, yeah, yeah. They know it. They know it as well as I do, because they've been hearing it whenever they've lived in the church, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. They hear it every three years, what Matthew has to say about this or that or the other thing, feeding the multitude. It's hard not to interrupt. So anyway, that goes on. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah, the yeah. most crucial be, element in our Catholic board. faith. It is the pinnacle of our prayer. It's the prayer pinnacle. The people then, this turns into a table. After we do the readings at the pulpit and over, after we finish the readings, we have what we call the Eucharistic prayer up here. <clears throat> and during the Eucharistic prayer, we're praying to prepare for our people and ourselves to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. The real body, no memory, or whatever other word you want to use, the real body and blood of Jesus Christ. We're preparing for that. And we go through these prayers, which comes right out of Scripture. Most everything in this liturgy is right out of Scripture, not, not only the uh, readings for, from, the old, from, the, from, from the Bible, but everything else comes from the Bible that we say. So at any rate, the, we call it the Eucharist, or the body and blood of Christ. That is the pinnacle of our prayer, because said, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Every time we have a weekday Mass, every time we have a, a Sunday Mass, any Mass, funeral Mass, you name it, marriage Mass, we always have the Eucharist where we feed on the body and blood of Jesus. And if you can just let your mind imagine, if that's really, I believe it's really, but if you could just imagine for a second, if that's really the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and it's the pinnacle of prayer, can you imagine what a moment that is for adoration? What a moment that is to pray for your dearly beloved mother or somebody. What is that? What a moment. I didn't tell him I was going to come and argue with him about transubstantiation. I told him, we're going to come and ask you, these are what we believe are essentials for salvation. But he's on, you can tell he's on the defense, even though there's been no attack. Why would he be on the defense? Well, he's done his homework. What do, they, what do they believe? What do those people believe? And how am I going to answer them? You know, he can't prove it from the Bible. And so his thing is, imagine with me how amazing it is to actually eat the physical uh, body and drink the actual blood of Jesus Christ. Well, I can imagine how grotesque that is. It's very difficult to imagine it to be amazing. But again, he's... What I want to say is that this is an individual that understands and knows the truth. Remember last week, one of the, what our conclusion was, and I want to remind us about it now, is that if you know someone who is in an ism, the Catholicism or uh, Mormonism or whatever, keep in mind that for the most part, their leadership is aware of the truth. Keep that in mind. Keep in mind that they are duped by individuals who know how to dupe them. And it, this guy is the epitome, I believe, of being winsome, being, uh, he's very, very great personality, and uh, he's the kind of a person that if you trust him, and he, and he gives you a lot of reason to trust him, then 
you know, it'd be easy to say, well, you know what, he's done his research, he knows, and so I'm going to believe him. And that's what he's banging on is, believe me, believe me, just believe me. You know, and so don't be hateful toward your Catholic family who are very devout and very believing. They've been duped by individuals who know the truth and are subverting it. And so keep that in mind. On the one hand, there's this terrible, evil deception that is deliberate. On the other hand, there is the deceived. You ever been deceived? You ever been tricked by something? Stop and tell a story here. When I was in college, I was uh, there was this guy who used to be a hustler in one of the Walmarts that all the uh, college students would go to. I came out of the store, and of course, you know, you're dressed in your college clothing, your college required clothing, so you're, a I mean, everybody knows who you are, knows what you look like. And so this guy approaches me, he says, hey man, you know, he's, he's a pretty distinguished looking guy, he's probably in his 50s. He said, man, I hate to ask you this, he said, but I got a, I'm in a real mess. He said, I'm traveling from, I can't remember where, I think it was from like Jackson or from Tallahassee to Mobile or something with a group of 15 kids in it, and they're, they're in a 15 passenger van actually on the interstate and belt a belt through and all I, I, I don't I, I left my checkbook at home it's back in checkbook days and I don't have any cash on me and I just I can I can write you a check I can get your address if you could give me some money to buy a buy a belt. Well I just told the guy and he, he the same guy approached me several times, didn't recognize me. But I said, Well you're in luck. You know, I happen to be an automotive mechanic and uh, there, I know where the Napa is. I got all my tools in my truck. Jump in, let's go. I'll fix your van for you. Get those kids off the interstate. Oh, I gotta go to the road. I'm like, no, we need to get those kids off the interstate right now. I remember being in a prayer group one night after the same guy approached me, and this guy said, "Praise the Lord, God, he'll be a blessing to someday." Some some guy, he uh, he was broke down. I said, on the side of the road, the 15 passenger van with all the you know kids waiting on the side of the road, and a bad and a belt, you know, the, the van threw a belt. Yeah, yeah. Did you meet him? Yeah, I said, yeah, he's a con artist. <laughs> well, he was a good guy, wasn't he? He's a, he's a devout guy. and You know, he's a poor college student giving money to help a guy who's a con artist. He, he, it wasn't his fault. You know, you could say, well, stupid kid, he should know better. But he didn't have any way of knowing. The guy was lying. The guy's story was credible. His, 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 the way he looked, the way he acted, the, what he was told was credible. And so error is oftentimes credible. And I want us just to be reminded about that. If you're going to share the gospel effectively with your friends and family, you can't be that stupid Catholicism, man, that blah, blah, blah. You know, don't go bashing. Uh, it's a part of their identity, who they are, and they've been deliberately duped on purpose by individuals who know the truth. Those individuals, I don't think there's a great chance of winning this guy to, to Christ. Maybe so. You know, maybe he'll come under great conviction in his last days he'll get saved. But he's in his 80s here. And so there's not a great chance of his receiving or being open for the truth. But now your friends and family members, if you understand where they're coming from and what they believe, there's a real good chance if you can ever get them into dialogue. If you ever get them into, well, let's discuss this and talk about this is what you believe. And if you don't know what they even believe, just saying, you know, it's a bunch of lies, a bunch of whatever, it's not really going to win them. Okay, so just want to point that out. That is. And so the priest then comes down, the people come up, and he goes on, he gets help, the church has a lot of people, and the people come right up here, and uh, they're coming up here from the pews, and just before they receive, they give a little bow, they better give a little bow, what a moment in their life, if they never have a chance to do that again, because they're going to die tomorrow, they kiss, did it today, kiss a man's hand, they walk up one more step, put their hand out like that, the priest says, the body of Christ, puts that in the hand, the person goes like this, puts that in the mouth, and turns. Then a person will come over here, and then there's a server here, and the person will get a cup, and the person will go, the blood of Christ. So this person here, before that, gives a little bow, adoration, takes the cup, and sips of the blood of Christ, and gives it back, then goes down for a moment of prayer. <clears throat> What a sublime moment. Can you imagine if that's really the body and blood of Jesus Christ? And you go back to sit down. What do you think you're going to say today? I mean, what a moment between you and Jesus. There's nothing equal to it in our Roman Catholic Church. That is the ultimate and the end of everything. After you've been doing all this scripture, learning all about Jesus, hearing it from every angle, the readings, the mass, everything else, you've received Jesus' body and blood, and there you are. Holy cow. 
that what a moment to be able to share the love that you have saying to Jesus I've made these mistakes and all that help me Jesus I'm looking for a new job whatever you want to say thank you for all you've done for me I've got life I'm in America I'm free I'm all this or that you gave it to me whatever you want to say what a moment so then when that's all over with Mass is ended, the priest goes right back the way he came in. I won't go any further, but my church is a place that can change. For example, there's a baptismal font over there. In our newest churches, there's a big, like a pool at the beginning where there's a baptismal font. It's more like a, like a, like a lake than it is one of those. And also, on the walls, you can't see it at this distance, but we have for Lenten time, the Stations of the Cross. And we go through that whole period of Jesus going through that terrible trial before they hang him on the cross. There's 15 stations of those. And each of these stations remembers some aspect of Jesus on his way to the cross and what's happening to him. There it is, the condemnation. You go, and then there, there's another one there. And you have prayers that go with it, a little worshiping. And you go to the next one. The priest is here. There's a server with a candle. There's a guy holding the, the uh, cross. And it says, the cross. Jesus is beginning to carry the cross. And you have the prayer for that. And then you go on to the next one. The first fall, Jesus takes that cross is so heavy on him. He takes his first fall. The prayers around his first fall. That goes all the way around our church like that. You finish facing the altar, which is the 15th station, and you celebrate then the resurrection. So there are different ways that we use our church during the course of the year, but those are a couple of them. We also have what we call a, um, an adoration day of our Lord, and we'll put on the altar a monstrance that has, a, it's like a big star, and in the center of the star is a little glass that door. It opens up, and you go over to the tabernacle, and you get a big host of Jesus, and you put them in there. That, that, it's on a little glass thing like my hand. It's round. You put that inside, you close the door. Then you put the monstrance on the altar. Then with some quiet, soft music, people come here all day, might be two or three or 15, and they come to adore our Lord, praying up to our Lord, which that too is the body and blood. And then... What's the first thing Paul told the Athenians about God? What? He dwelt not in temples. He dwelt not in a temple made with hands. They put God in a little box. They put him up on the altar, and then people can come in and and be like, "Wow, God, Jesus is in there today." Mm -hmm. In this little box, let's go see Jesus. Of course, he's in all the different churches. You know, actually, physically, we understand as believers the omnipresence of God, but they're not teaching omnipresence of God. They're talking. They're teaching the temple that God's in a little building, mm -hmm. presence of God. And there's just so many inconsistencies in it. But what, again, is the purpose of it? Well, to get the, the hearts, the adoration of the people. And so just, just keep this in mind. Remember that religion, again, tries to capture, tries to take uh, what belongs to God, the, the worship of God that, that He deserves. And this is, I mean, this is, this is just exactly pagan. Uh, why, would, why would this be developed as Christianity? Why would Christians come up with this? Why would Romanism come up with this? Well, because it comes from pagan culture. It comes from a very Greek culture that Paul was talking about. The Romans assimilated all of the Greeks' myths and took their gods and renamed them, but didn't destroy any of their temples, didn't, didn't supplant any of their gods. And so when Romanism became the religion of the empire, when Christianity, quote, not Christianity, but when Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire and they became Romanist, the paganism naturally came in. The people who loved the idea of a God dwelling in a temple of hands really likes this Jesus in a box thing that we see him talking about. Yeah. <clears throat> now I'm using a little bit of sarcasm and, and I don't mean I, I have to be careful about how I say it, but that literally is what it is. It's putting Jesus in a box. And that's exactly what he just told us there. And so it's it's a real help for us. Most Catholics don't know about this. We don't really know what it symbolizes and they haven't really thought about it. But if you ever uh, want a chance with your Catholic friends, you could you could just allude to this. You could say, you know, I saw I saw an interview of a priest where he talked about Jesus being, you know, in this little little box thing and people coming in during the day. And uh, where, where, what is that?
get that from? What does that mean? Most people have never thought about it. Get people to think, and you'll have the opportunity to share truth with them. The other day we have a benediction, and then we put that away. So during the course of the year, there's all kinds of things we do uh, in this church, and those are some of the things that we do that are probably some of the more important. So does that sound okay? Yes. And you can cut anything out you want. Would you, would you show us the confessional and how that works? Yes. Um, I'm not happy with this 30-year-old church in terms of the confessionals. The, the newer churches, or even some of the older ones, they'll have like a little room that will be about this size to the wall. And then they'll have a screen. When the person comes in, they can go right behind the screen, or they can come right around here in a chair where they face the priest. They can elect to see the priest, or he can't see them, or they can be right here where they can talk. Now this, over here, doesn't accomplish that because in the early days of the church, they all went behind the screen. Nobody sat in front of the priest. But nowadays, you know how we are. We're more, uh, what would that be called? It's more of a psychological reason for being able to see the priest. Miracle reason, whatever. So at any rate, you can just go in and you can see the screen. That's a screen and they can kneel here or then they can go back in that other chair and I'll be sitting in that chair. See the other chair? And, and, and they'll be looking at me, see, face to face. So they can elect to be face to face or they can kneel behind the screen so that I can't see them and they can't see me. And I could care less, whatever makes them happy. That's another facet of, uh, you know, what goes on in here that I forget. We've got a healing mass where the people come to church and they're in every other, every other pew. And we have healing prayers where we take sacred oils and we bless them on their forehead and then the palms of their hands and we recite these beautiful healing prayers. Then we have the St. Blaise Day where we have the two candles and we have a prayer uh, to St. Blaise to heal the throats and any other illnesses. So there's, you know, stuff going on all year that we do. That seems okay. Wonderful. Right up there is the tabernacle. Well, we have extra hosts after our masses. You know, Jesus is present of those hosts at all times. They, he doesn't run out after 20 minutes. And so we keep them in that tabernacle. And any time I come in this door and I pass that tabernacle, because of my legs, I bow yeah, to our Lord who's inside that tabernacle. He's in uh, little metal containers, <laughs> saboriums, with a top on them. Get a picture of the box Jesus is in. <laughs> and uh, there's one of the women who supplies those flowers new fl fresh flowers like that every week in honor of our Lord that are there in the tabernacle. And then one other thing over here, I would better not overlook that I stressed it in our talk. I'm a little sorry I didn't talk more about receiving our Lord's body and blood than I did. I try to follow the format. Over here is the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary, right up there. And Small we have coming. a lot of, uh, in the south end, the southern part of Florida here, we have a lot of uh, Caribbean people, South American people who have uh, come to America to live. And we have a high percentage of those people right here in, in the uh, Broward and Bay Counties. And the Virgin Mary is very important to them. So you see all those little lights up there, those candles? One of these, it could be any one of us, but we Anglos aren't quite like that to that extent, but the Hispanic is. The Italians are too. So they come up here at any time and they'll kneel and they'll ask Mary to help them. Because. Let's stop here just for a minute and let's talk about it. So we, he's saying himself and Brother Chris and myself, we're you know we're not too big in the Virgin Mary. She's not really important to us, but you know we have this here for the you know, the Caribbean and, and the Spanish. You know the Spanish folks they're big into the whole you know Mary, Blessed Mother Mary thing, and, and the Italians are too. Let's just stop for a second. Roman Catholic. 
What nationality would the Roman Catholic Church be? Italian. Italian. It's an Italian religion, isn't it? Okay. So there's just a little bit of a spin here of, well, you know, not, not all Catholics, <laughs> just the Spanish and the Italian ones, which is how many Catholics? Most, and it's an Italian religion. So, fits under the entire umbrella. So, what he's saying here is not going to be very honest. And you'll, you'll hear some more, it's kind of laughable. We had a fire here at one time because of these little lit candles. What we do now is they can push a button. I mean, who could burn this whole building down with a little carelessness? And a lot of the old churches, never goes wrong for them. They've had candles in those churches for 100 years, and nothing goes wrong. And here we are, about 10 years old, and we have a fire. So they got this to reduce that potential. I guess it goes off by itself. And so these women come and pray to Mary, talk to Jesus, help them out, whatever their worries are. Some of us are into men. You know what I mean, fellas? Some of us like men. I mean, just naturally, we hang out with the boys, we drink with the boys, we play golf with the boys. Some of us are better at uh, our, our women. And if we want something important to say, if we got a female friend, we love to be able to talk to a female friend where our guys, you know, they're, you just can't tell them this stuff because guys are guys. But if you have a good female friend. And so it is with people as far as their spirituality. And that Mary is available to intercede. Has God a man? I, we're, we're making a theological argument on the gender of God. Here, I just want you to notice this. To pray for them means a lot to some people. They might have backgrounds where they never even had a mother. But they do have a heavenly mother, and they know it. So they do, a percent of them might come over here and uh, pray to Mary. And the first part of our prayer to Mary comes right out of Scripture. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. That came right. <laughs> Who said that to Mary? Elizabeth. Michael. Angel. Gabriel. Gabriel. Elizabeth. Gabriel. Yeah. What? Gabriel. Oh, Gabriel. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, was it what hail means, and what hail mean? What hail meant to an angel? What hail means to us? It's completely different. Hail's not a worship word. Okay, but since it comes right out of Scripture, worship of Mary. Out of Scripture. It's not, we didn't make it up. Most of our prayers basically come out of Scripture. A lot of them don't. I like that word basically. So that's about it. And then a lot of them don't. I'm going to go over and have some dinner tonight. Shoot you guys back to your cars. We're done. All <laughs> right, Ryan. Thank, right. Thank you for your time. It's nice that you came, fellas. You. you don't mind me my being a wise guy, do you? No, not at all. You're a good guy as well. You're a good guy to put up with me. And you better not take my picture when I say I think you're a good guy. Because I don't want people thinking I think you're a good guy. Yeah. We don't want anyone thinking he's a good guy. Right? Do you feel that way too? No, thanks a lot. We'll start our get together as this is the interview. That you're sure welcome, Ryan, to be here today so we could visit a little bit. We call on the Lord. Holy Spirit to be with us to make this a very beneficial opportunity for your seminar on Sunday. Is that on Sunday? Yes, sir. So we pray that that will be a blessing for all of those and even for yourself. We thank our men who are here to uh, to film this for us. They look they've done a very good job and, and they're enjoyable guys. So anytime you want to start, however you want to start, I'm happy to be of whatever help I can. Okay. Well, first of all, let me just. Uh, express our gratitude. Thanks for you taking the time to set aside to meet with us today and to answer some of the questions that we have. And we uh, certainly have appreciated getting uh, to speak to you even before we began our interview this this afternoon. I guess morning's gone, and so we're really we were really looking forward to coming and being here today. And we just want to express our gratitude to you for taking the time. We know that. This is a very busy place, and that you're very busy, and so 
We want you to know that we do value your time and appreciate the effort that you've taken to be with us today. But just to say, in all my activities, uh, there's a lot of things you do uh, as a minister, but no activity equals the activity of in any way sharing uh, the love of Jesus Christ uh, for people. And uh, I would always want to stop right where I'm at, regardless of what I'm doing, if I have an opportunity to share the Word of God. So when this comes along, it's an opportunity to visit with your people this way, then whatever I was doing over there, it doesn't equal being able to share our Lord. Basically so, the Word of God. That's my feeling. I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much. Well, I want to begin just by introducing you, because on Sunday there will be a number of people that won't be able to shake your hand and meet you face to face, and so I'd like to just tell them a little bit of, about what we've learned today. This is Father Bill Bowles. Yes. And William Bowles officially, we call him Father Bill, and he has been in this parish for eight years, and uh, he's revealed to us his age. We would have guessed probably 20s or 30s. And <laughs> Father Bowles, your actual age? I'm 78. I'll be 79 in March. All right. So enjoying good health, and he says that he could take both of the cameramen with one hand behind his back. Easily. So we're going to film that following this. So yeah, stay tuned. Sure. If you're not interested in anything else, that should interest you. Do they have insurance? <laughs> what difference does it make? <laughs> He's got a great personality, doesn't he? Okay. So uh, I want to ask about your calling, if that's okay. Just yeah. how, did you, how did you come to be in the position of being a priest? Well, uh, see if I can make it short. Um, you know, uh, in the Catholic Church, we have altar boys during our services, and I was an altar boy in the fifth, sixth, and fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grades, where you put on the black cassock and the white surplice, and and then you would be serving with the priest. And I was inspired by that at that age, and I was inspired by our, we had four priests, and they were all very dynamic men, and I I, I really liked each of them. They had different personalities, but I liked them. And so that was maybe a step. I didn't uh, know I was looking to be a priest, but I'm sure that played a role. And then during the course of my life, I would always be interested in reading about priests and what they were doing. And um, uh, later on in life, I went to a Catholic university and uh, to the Jesuits, who were the educators of our church. and. Um, uh, we had some priests there who were marvelous men, I, I, really marvelous men. And as you get to know them and their philosophies and their enthusiasm for the Lord, um, you know, that's another little signpost, I guess you could say. And always uh, behind the scenes, I would think, uh, there would be this little uh, Holy Spirit kind of a thing going on in me where I didn't always reflect on it, but was still working perhaps. And then I got up into my later years and I uh, remember up in uh, Minneapolis, I was driving around on a beautiful uh, uh, Lake of the Isles area of Minneapolis with a lot of very beautiful, nice homes around this lake and the curly cues and everything. It's about three miles around it. It was in the evening time and the lights were on and, uh, and I was feeling kind of like a little bit, I don't know, badly. I, I feel, I, I, was I really being fulfilled? I was in the business publishing world, and was I really being fulfilled as to where I was at that time? And um, sorry, we couldn't get further along in the doctrinal aspect. We actually are out of time this morning. Uh, it's a. I want to watch the whole video with with our church. And again, the reason why would be that if you have a Catholic friend, you could very easily share the gospel with them. You can even use this video for a tool. Just go on YouTube, say, hey, can I watch a video with you? And then stop it, you know, at different points. Any person here today who knows the gospel understands that there are many points of dispute. Before you even talk, we're not even to the doctrinal part. But we're just talking about what you believe about the church being the actual temple of God and where God lives at, where God dwells. There's a major theological difference between Christ and us and between the believers assembling and Christ in the midst of us. 
and Christ in a building or Christ in a box. Big difference in that. And, you know, this is all in the Bible, basically, except for the parts that aren't. Statements like that would help you to help your friends to understand what's different about you. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. We believe that it's with, without error. We believe that it's God's full authority. And we believe that anything which contradicts the Scripture is wrong. And again, next week we're going to see what they believe about the contradicting of the Scripture. Man's dogma versus God's. And what they believe about the Bible is different. And again, our Sunday school class we were looking at, in order to know for sure that somebody is saved, what they believe about the Word of God and what they believe about the person of Christ are absolutely essential for salvation. And so we'll see it again next week. God, thank you for the Sunday school hour we've had this morning. And I pray that it may profit us, may open our eyes. Lord, give us compassion and understanding for our lost friends who are religious. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll start church on time, even though we're two minutes late now. Which parish did you film this at? St. John the Baptist, right over on Bayview Drive. Oh, okay.